schedule here. Um, so I'm here because I help out at the Brown Center as faculty fellow for scholarship and publication. My name is Dr. Melinda Hall and I teach in philosophy. I'm very glad to introduce our presenter today, who's Dr. Jesse Fox. He'll be chatting with us about uh, one of his significant research projects, which is on spiritual bypass. Um, so I really look forward to hearing um, a bit about that today. Um, I'll be leaving the session um, at about 10 after the hour, and Harry Price will continue on as moderator today. Uh, we look forward to having discussion uh, with Dr. Fox um, as we continue, so we'll listen to his presentation. Um, and he has, uh, yeah, about 30, 35 minutes or whatever works for him. It's very flexible. We don't have a second presenter today. So after he's done, um, we can have a group discussion. So welcome. Uh, th thank you so much, Jesse, for presenting. And I'll go ahead and turn off my camera now and turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, and Melinda, uh, I'll, I'll be really interested to hear. Can I delve into some of the philosophy behind this? Um, as I actually started out um, my academic life as a uh, major in um, psychology first and then went to, uh, excuse me, actually philosophy first and then went to psychology. So um, a lot of what so I'm we lost talking you. about. <laughs> what was that? I said, so we lost you. And then I said, oh, wonderful. No. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> um, can you all see me now? Yes, we can, but not your. Uh, I, I lost you now. Hold on one second. Jesse, I can hear you just fine. Can you see me? I can see you. I just, yeah, I can see you, just not your slides yet, I said. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, all right. Yeah, um, yeah I was uh, saying, Melinda, I don't know where I got cut off there, uh, but uh, I do delve into some of the philosophy behind this um, toward the latter part of the presentation. So um, I'll be interested to see what you think about it. Um, because I started out as a as a philosophy major before I went into uh, psychology, um, and so um, yeah, so uh, forms a lot of where I went with uh, this topic. So uh, for those of you who are joining, um, I don't have uh, everybody necessarily in front of me, but um, I did uh, want to share a, a slide here uh, to give you a little bit of a sense of what I'm talking about. Uh, which, hold on one second, let me share my screen. All right, there we go. All right. So, um, a little bit about um, just who I am um, and how that relates to this topic. Um, I'm, I currently serve as assistant professor of uh, counselor education. Um, and I now introduce um, all my new uh, conversations with strangers as, but I also have tenure now, so I'm <laughs> moving into associate, uh, which feels good to have that uh, behind me. Um, but uh, but I, I currently teach in the um, counselor education department. So um, a lot of what I'm gonna be talking about really pertains to, um, to the field of counseling, or also known as um, you know psychotherapy. So sometimes people hear it called counseling or psychotherapy. Um, and so um, the topic of spiritual bypass um, was something that I had gotten interested in about uh, five, six years ago, I wanna say. Um, and uh, hold on one second, okay. Um, five, six years ago, I'm going to move this because I can't really see anything actually. Okay, there we go. Um, when I've been working with uh, doctoral students actually who were working on their research projects and um, they would often talk about um, this phenomenon um, that they would encounter with uh, their research participants, sometimes with their clients, actually quite, a f quite frequently with the clients that they were seeing. Um, that we call a spiritual bypass, and I'll get into all of that in a minute. But what I'm going to be sharing with you um, is really uh, the, the topic of a new book that I'm working on, um, which is called Spirituality and Avoiding uh, Difficult Emotions. Um, and 
this is a, a book that I'm co-authoring with uh, Craig Cashwell. And so um, we're, we're working through the book currently right now, so it's not complete yet. So what I'm going to be sharing with you is really kind of the first um, two, three chapters um, of the book uh, that we've been working on. So the topic of spiritual bypass um, is something that you really have to get after you understand, I think, uh, what's called religion, spirituality, and health. Um, this is where I like to start because um, if you're not a part of the mental health field, um, there's been a lot of changes that have happened over the past 10, 20, maybe 30 years. Um, and that is where um, we have started to invest more and more in the concept of wellness. And what you see in front of you is uh, SAMHSA's uh, actually uh, uh, model of wellness. There's you know, five, six major models of wellness, but SAMHSA is a really influential model um, and one that people I think can kind of grasp pretty easily um, just at a glance. What you see in front of you um, are the eight dimensions of wellness. So at the top is the emotional. So counselors, psychotherapists tend to focus a lot on the emotional side of things. Uh, we also tend to focus a lot on the intellectual. Uh, we tend to focus a lot on the occupational. Um, less so um, things like uh, environmentals, less so things like financial necessarily. But um, one area that um, has been a focus of a lot of my work um, as a counselor has been in this area right here, which is in the spiritual um, dimension of wellness. So the first kind of major thing to understand about how wellness works is that each dimension um, is an important part of what makes up the whole person. Um, and so if one side of um, the wellness uh, model is affected, it by nature affects the other dimensions of wellness. So if there is emotional turmoil that we experience in life, um, we tend to also experience some effect in our social life, sometimes also in our occupational life, et cetera. Um, and so these areas around here, with the exception of spiritual, I would say um, have the most history to them within Western um, counseling psychotherapy. This area here is a bit newer um, in terms of not necessarily the history of, of civilization or anything like that, but definitely in terms of how it has been um, focused, a point of focus now within um, health models, uh, medical health, as well as mental health. Um, so a lot of what I'm going to be talking about here has to do with how this area here interfaces with these other dimensions um, of life. Okay, so in terms of how uh, people tend to work with this in uh, Western psychology, Western psychotherapy, um, is through one of four major perspectives. Um, first, they may see uh, religion, spirituality as something that's irrational. So this is something that's called the rejectionist view. Um, it's a delusion. And I will talk quite a bit about this perspective um, in the later slides. Uh, they can also see it exclusively. Um, so in exclusive terms, meaning that there's just one path to truth and that path uh, is, is my path. They can also see it through a constructivist lens. Um, and so counselors, psychotherapists who tend to have a constructivist lens tend to see um, their client's worldview, their values as primary. And uh, regardless of their particular perspective, um, uh, we work uh, as counselors, psychotherapists within the worldview perspective of the client. The last one, is the pluralist, um, and that, that would be um, the counselor or the psychotherapist who accepts that there's many paths um, to a spiritual reality um, that, that exists for people. Um, I would certainly put myself more in this perspective, um, both as a counselor as well as a, as a researcher. Now, um, 
in 2019, uh, myself and my colleagues, uh, Joe Stewart Siffing, Stuart Sicking and Paul Deal, um, we wrote a book called Bringing Religion and Spirituality into Therapy that really kind of delves into that pluralistic perspective of how the sacred is approached in, in counseling and mental health. Um, and what we have found to be really helpful to understand these issues is what's called a psycho-spiritual theme. And what psycho-spiritual themes are, are these kind of bridge concepts that help us to um, bring together a diverse perspective of thought, both within religious traditions as well as in psychotherapy, theory, um, and how those then kind of come together, connect, um, in a, a lot of different ways. And so there are four kind of primary psycho-spiritual themes that we see as really salient and which um, uh, mental health care needs to be paying attention to if they're going to understand what their client's uh, mental health is, their wellness, broadly speaking, as well as that spiritual dimension um, that they often bring into therapy. Um, the four themes that we focus heavily on are this theme of self, like who is the person, who am I, um, what is my role in the world, um, suffering, uh, why are we in pain at certain times in life, uh, what is the meaning of suffering, um, and then what do I do with the suffering that I experience. Uh, the next one is change, um, and that is uh, you know, what changes are needed, what changes are wanted. Um, and then the last one is flourishing. Um, and flourishing gets it kind of, what's the trajectory of, of one's life? You know, what's the vision or the hope that directs the work um, of counseling and psychotherapy? Um, this one right here of the theme of suffering, we find really, really important, um, primarily because the reason why people come to therapy is typically because they are in pain um, and they've exhausted efforts uh, on their own to be able to resolve the pain that they're, they're experiencing. So pain and how we deal with it is really, really prominent, not only within religious traditions, but also the purposes behind um, therapy itself. So, the person who coined this term, spiritual bypass, uh, you see pictured there, that's John Wellwood. John Wellwood um, was a Buddhist psychotherapist back in the 1980s. Um, noticed that there was this um, issue that develops um, when people um, embrace a spiritual uh, path um, in his context of Buddhism, um, that there's this kind of tendency to get um, hooked on Kind of the pleasant feelings of spirituality um, and what tends to happen is that um, people start to avoid some of the really um, difficult sometimes trauma work um, that they are burying um, either consciously or subconsciously. Um, John Wellwood coined the term in about 1984 and then um, over time this term has grown um, through the 90s, 2000s, and into um, the current time, um, both in its popularity within um, counseling psychotherapy circles, but then also um, in popular media. Um, John Wellwood defines spiritual bypass in, in these terms. He said, spiritual bypass or spiritual bypassing is a tendency to use spiritual ideas and practices to sidestep or avoid facing unresolved emotional issues, psychological wounds, and unfinished uh, developmental tasks. Um, what I think is really interesting is that more and more um, religious scholars, religious teachers, um, are starting to use this term spiritual bypassing. Um, the uh, person you see pictured there is Jules Harris, um, and he is a Zen uh, teacher. Um, he wrote a book called Zen Beyond Mindfulness. Um, mindfulness has become a really popular kind of term. Um, it's become a really popular um, mode, actually, of, of medical practice where people adopt a uh, 
uh, mindfulness practice use it um, as a way of decreasing their experience of negative emotions, increase their experience of positive emotions. Um, and what Jules Harris noticed um, in many of the novices who would come to him is that they would get really attached to those positive feelings that mindfulness would produce, um, but those would um, really predictably um, fizzle out. And so those moments of spiritual high would become transient. And what he would notice is that when that would happen, instead of delving deeper into the insight of the attachment of the ego um, and how the ego attaches to certain emotional states, um, novices would do what we would call like spiritual window shopping. They would move on to another uh, meditation technique or they would uh, simply leave um, the practice entirely. Um, this also shows up um, in Christian circles. Um, the person pictured there is uh, Father Richard War, who runs the uh, Center for Action and Contemplation in um, New Mexico. Um, and he said contemplation shouldn't be used uh, to spiritually bypass what is real, harmful, or unjust in our lives or the world around us. Um, we cannot jump over this world or its woundedness and still try to love God. We must love God through, in, and with, and even because of this world. Um, so what I find really interesting is that um, if you really look into the particular uh, teachings within world religions, um, they've already developed a language for this. They've already developed um, actually ways to also um, deal with spiritual bypass. In 2017, um, my colleagues and I, uh, Craig Cashwell and Gabriella uh, Picciotto, started to, to study this more scientifically. And so uh, we published an instrument in 2017 called the Spiritual Bypass Scale. Um, and we operationally defined um, spiritual bypass um, as a defensive, usually unconscious psychological posture cultivated by a tendency to privilege or exaggerate spiritual beliefs or experiences over and against psychological needs creating a means of avoiding or bypassing difficult emotions or experiences. So what we saw is really kind of a tendency um, that makes spiritual bypassing more or less likely um, as a factor of individual differences. So we measure it primarily through a trait theory of personality. Um, through that, we've formed a, a team of collaborators um, who you see pictured here. Some of them are in uh, full-time uh, therapy, counseling, private practice work. Some of them are academicians. Um, and so through that work, we've been able to um, gather quite a bit of information actually about how spiritual, uh, spiritual bypass manifests um, through both quantitative as well as qualitative uh, research we found um, what you see in front of you are things that coincide with spiritual bypass. Um, whether or not that's an irrational commitment to a spiritual leader, um, so to speak, privileging the spiritual leader uh, to an extreme uh, degree, um, attempting to control or contain life's challenges only through spiritual practice, um, what's called alexithymia, uh, which is emotional repression, uh, so very similar to how Jules uh, Harris noticed uh, repressing the negative emotions that mindfulness would evoke. Um, and then um, through things like religious, spiritual addiction, uh, compulsive goodness, uh, materialism, spiritual materialism, um, et cetera, the list kind of goes on. Um, there are lots of examples, I think, now that are popping up. Uh, outside of uh, the context of counseling and psychotherapy. And one that is really uh, tragic, actually, um, was the story of uh, Dale Newman, um, as well as his wife, Lilani Newman. Um, they were convicted of second degree reckless homicide in 2008. And, and the backstory to this is that um, Dale was something of a uh, kind of rogue, uh, preacher. He never completed the process of ordination um, in a charismatic uh, tradition of Christianity. Um, and uh, 
more or less started his own um, his own uh, tradition or his own um, uh, church. Um, what what eventually happened is that his daughter had been suffering for many years from undiagnosed diabetes, um, and um, one period of time it became incredibly um, incredibly problematic for his daughter. And uh, their prayer group uh, decided instead of going to a medical doctor to um, get emergency medical care, uh, they formed a prayer circle around her, um, praying for healing. Um, and she eventually, tragically, actually died. Um, it was only when she was convulsing on the ground that one of the members of the um, members of the prayer group decided to call um, uh, for emergency medical care. Um, during the trial, uh, the subsequent trial, the assistant director, uh, assistant district attorney, uh, Lamont Jacobson, uh, said that Newman was overwhelmed by pride in his interpretation of the Bible and selfishly um, uh, let Madeline die as a test of faith. Um, and so unfortunately, uh, this is something that coincides exactly with uh, the type of research that we have, we have uncovered. Um, in our interviews with um, uh, people who have gone through spiritual bypass firsthand, as well as counselors, psychotherapists who um, have encountered this work in the lives of their clients, there is kind of a spiritual narcissism that can develop, um, and in this case with deadly consequences that went along with it. Um, after sharing stories like this, I have had a number of people come up to me afterwards and actually share personal stories um, of people who have had really, really scary and sometimes uh, deadly um, encounters with this, uh, whether or not that was a family member who didn't seek medical care um, for uh, life-threatening illnesses, but instead would do things like um, uh, write copious amounts of scriptures in their room, to pray away the illness. Now, um, what does spirituality look like in the absence of spiritual bypass? Um, there's this great quote from Leonard Cohen uh, that says, there's a crack in everything and that's where the light comes in. Um, in other words, uh, suffering pain is a part of life and actually the pain that we experience is a place in which we can experience uh, spiritual renewal. Um, and you'll see that as a, a really common actual take on the notion of pain and suffering within religious traditions. Um, Khalil Gibran said, your pain is the breaking of the shell that encloses your understanding. It's the bitter potion by which the physician within you heals your sick self. So therefore trust the physician and drink his remedy in silence and tranquility. Uh, back to uh, Richard War for a moment. Uh, Richard Rohr has a great quote about um, pain and how that relates to spirituality. He says, all great spirituality is about what we do with our pain. In this time of suffering, we have to ask ourselves, what are we going to do with our pain? Are we going to blame it on others? Are we going to try to fix it? No one lives on this earth without it. It's the great teacher. Although none of us want to admit it, if we do not transform our pain, we will transmit it um, in some form. So we're kind of back to this psycho-spiritual theme that I started with about uh, suffering. Um, and so the religious traditions uh, have kind of three major ways that they deal with suffering. Um, they see it either as suffering as stagnation, enslavement. It, in other words, it's kind of a warning signal that you're doing certain things that are problematic and those are showing up in the pain that you experience. But they also see suffering as a form of transformation, potentially, as well as freedom, seeing it as more or less a friend that awakens you um, to pursue your life at a deeper level. Um, or um, they see it as a catalyst for justice. And so um, this uh, you know, is kind of the impetus for social justice movements um, that see pain and suffering not as an individual problem, but as a systemic uh, or uh, systemic and um, social cultural problem. So this brings up a lot of background and history um, that 
we deal an entire chapter in our book to really start to unpack. I know I've breezed through quite a bit of complicated information in terms of how that all relates to mental health. But in our book, what we thought was really important to do is to provide readers with a bit more context um, for how um, some of those themes that I've mentioned surface within um, counseling psychotherapy in, in the Western world. Um, Ernie Kurtz uh, has this really great quote. He wrote the book you see in front of you, The Spirituality of Imperfection, um, The Storytelling and the Search for Meaning. Um, he said, mental health and spirituality only know each other by caricature. What he means by that is that as um, uh, Western psychotherapy started to take off and religious traditions um, developed in parallel to each other, they started to see each other in more or less reductionist terms. Um, Western psychotherapy is it's historically kind of vacillated between two polarities, either seeing religious uh, experience through a suspicious lens, which is the rejectionist view, or accommodatively, meaning that um, uh, the counselor psychotherapist doesn't have to believe in the religious experience of the client, but they need to work within uh, the, the client's worldview. So they tend to kind of vacillate between those two polarities. Um, where I really tried to trace this back to, I really got interested in, okay, where does all of that come from? Where, where does those two polarities, um, so to speak, originate? And the closest point of origin that I can um, identify actually is the person you see depicted in front of you, which is um, Auguste Comte, uh, who is a French philosopher of the Enlightenment. And um, uh, his ideas are still very, very influential on how um, all of these topics are, are couched, how they're context, um, and so I think it's important to, to mention him. Um, he thought that there were really kind of three phases to human history. Um, he thought that there was a theological phase. Uh, that's where the world religions develop, the gods, the gods, goddesses, etc. cetera. Um, but then he saw that there was a weakening in those assumptions, which he called the metaphysical phase, where um, the explanation of why pain and suffering happen uh, comes from more impersonal forces of nature. And then the third phase, which uh, he would probably say we're still in, is the positive phase. And that's where we get um, the notion of positivism um, and the scientific uh, method came out of uh, this perspective. Um, and that is, is that um, physical forces is all that we need to explain for why life happens and also the meaning uh, behind our suffering. He went so far as to call himself actually the high priest of the religion of humanity, in other words, positivism, um, was something that actually alienated him from his, um, from his own colleagues later in life. Um, that perspective, um, from what I can tell, has a real kind of clear line of, of effect on thinkers like Marx, uh, Nietzsche, Freud, uh, who you see uh, from left to right. Um, Marx uh, said that religion is the opium of the people, um, that it's a way that people numb themselves from the harshness of life. Um, Nietzsche said, you know, God is dead, God remains dead, we've killed him. Um, in other words, uh, humanity's grown to the point where we don't need superstitious illusions uh, to comfort us. Freud said something very similar. He said religion's in infantilism. Um, it's a way that we regress when we're under emotional turmoil. Um, th that point here, um, Freud is really the transition from these philosophers into um, Western psychotherapists. Um, the person you see here is uh, B.F. Skinner, uh, one of the founders of uh, behaviorism. Um, he considered God an archetypal pattern of an explanatory fiction. Um, Albert Ellis here um, uh, considered religion a neurosis, um, and he went so far as to say virtually all saints and mystics are prone to this neurosis. Um, the last person here is a little bit different. Um, this is Irvin Yalom, uh, 
Um, uh, he's different in the sense that one, he's still alive um, and the others have passed away. Um, Yalom uh, was uh, trained in, um, in uh, uh, Freudianism, Freudian analytic psychotherapy. Um, and Yalom believes that uh, religion's irrational, uh, but he's unique from these other thinkers in that you shouldn't subvert it, though, in psychotherapy. So he has a bit more of an accommodative view of how to work with religion and spirituality and mental health. On the on opposite end of the spectrum are some balancing perspectives. And so how this developed over time is um, uh, William James pictured here um, wrote his you know, real influential work in religious studies and the psychology of religion, the varieties of religious experience. And William James didn't necessarily see it um, in the same terms as the thinkers that I've showed you before. Um, he was really um, invested in the experience and what the experience would then translate to into practical terms. Um, so James was more of a pragmatist. He wasn't necessarily invested in um, the debate over whether or not God exists in metaphysical terms, but, um, but he was uh, kind of the founder, actually, of the modern psychology of religion and neutrality in that sense, that he investigated it scientifically. Um, Carl Jung, who parted ways with um, Sigmund Freud, um, had a much more positive view than Freud did have of religion. Um, and he said religion's a window into the collective unconscious. Um, and so uh, when someone would dream about religious imagery, um, Jung didn't see that as a symbol of a sex drive as Freud might have, but he would take it seriously and take it at actually face value. If someone's dreaming about religion, it really is about religion. Um, and then the last one is Gordon Alport, um, the personality psychologist. He wasn't so much a psychotherapist as um, he was one of the first to really start to measure religiousness um, in quantitative terms. Um, and so he developed uh, what's called a measure of intrinsic religiosity versus e extrinsic rel religiosity and then started to map out how different psychosocial uh, constructs uh, relate to those. Um, this is a really interesting quote from uh, Carl Jung. He said, no matter what the world thinks of religious experience, the one who has it possesses the great treasure um, of a thing that has provided him with a source of life, meaning and beauty, and that has given a new splendor to the world and to mankind. Is there, uh, as a matter of fact, any better truth about ultimate things than the one that helps you to live? Um, so like William James, uh, um, Jung wasn't interested in kind of the metaphysical debate of God's existence. He was much more interested in how one's experience of God then played out in the rest of your life. And so from his perspective, that could have different content to it. But ultimately what matters is does it help you to live a life with deeper meaning, greater beauty? Um, etc. Um, the last person um, that I'll reference historically is Carl Rogers. And Carl Rogers, too, had um, a, more of a accommodationist perspective um, on these things. Um, and later in his life, started to talk about spirituality in more explicit terms. And he never created a uh, kind of theory or um, practical terms, how to work with religion or spirituality and health. Uh, but he did, you know, acknowledge that there were some sacred experiences that he would have um, in his work with clients. And so uh, the quote that you see in front of you was written a couple of years before his death, actually. Um, he says, when I'm at my best, meaning working with clients, it seems that my inner spirit has reached out and touched the inner spirit of the other our relationship transcends itself and becomes a part of something larger. Uh, profound growth and healing and energy um, are present. So this all kind of brings us back to where, do, where are we now um, in terms of religion, spirituality, and health. Um, since those primary thinkers, um, 
the, the psychology of religion and spirituality has really embraced um, the scientific empirical method to look at how this relates to health. Um, and there's three major points I want to make and then um, wrap it up with uh, getting back to how does this relate to bypass. Um, in 2010, there were over 3,300 studies documented um, investigating the relationship between religion, spirituality, and health. Um, overwhelmingly, those tend to have positive associations with health. So people are less likely to be depressed, less likely to be anxious, uh, less likely to abuse substances, and more likely to have strong social support, more likely to have a high degree of meaning, purpose in their life, et cetera. It even has positive associations with cardiovascular health, um, uh, lower risk for mortality, um, lower risk for uh, chronic illness. Um, within psychotherapy, there's been um, a meta-analysis that came out just a couple of years ago um, that has examined 97 randomized controlled trials of looking at uh, religious spiritual um, interventions and their effect on mental health. Um, and uh, those also have been promising and positive results. Um, they tend to have a positive influence on psychotherapy outcomes overall. And then lastly, um, looking at the kind of darker side of how these relate, um, there's over 30 longitudinal studies now that have been conducted on psychological distress and how that relates to what's called religious spiritual struggles when people have a spiritual or religious crisis um, in their life. Those have really powerful effects on psychological distress. So um, modern psychology, religion, and spirituality has moved on a bit from the perspectives that I showed you. Um, there's a broader consensus now that religion and spirituality are multidimensional. So there's, there's a lot more quantitative information now just within the past 10, 15 years. Um, in 2010, there were 3,000 studies. I would expect that number to have even um, blossomed more in the past 10 years. Um, religion, spirituality, they're multi-level, meaning they can be individually relevant, but they can also be communally relevant as well as more systemically relevant. Um, they're salient to diverse identities. So um, within the United States, uh, we're seeing a massive kind of influx of uh, new uh, religions into the United States, minority religions into the United States, and all of those will have implications for, for mental health. Um, there are also factors of individual differences. So um, we can measure uh, these factors um, quantitatively um, across different groups and across different individuals as well. Um, they also explain psycho, psychological outcomes over and above other psychological factors like personality or things like social support. So even when we control for those factors, religion, spirituality, metrics, still explain psychological outcomes. And then lastly, they're multivalent, uh, meaning um, we've reached the point now is, is not so much is there a connection between religion, spirituality, and health, but what is the connection? Is it positive? Is it negative? Under what circumstances is it positive or negative? So, I think that's a really good segue to kind of wrap up how this relates to spiritual bypass, because I often get kind of the um, simple response, is spiritual bypass good or is it bad for mental health? Um, and the answer that I can gather from all the research that we've conducted um, is that it's really complicated, actually. Um, spiritual bypass is multivalent. It doesn't have one single association with uh, health and well-being. So what we have found is that spiritual past positively related to spirituality and religiosity, which makes a great deal of sense. But it's also positively related to anxiety and stress. It's negatively related to depression. So on the one hand, it may elevate people's anxiety. On the other hand, it may decrease their, their uh, experience of depression. 
Um, it's also positively related to emotional repression in general. Um, it's also negatively related, though, to um, psychological and medical help seeking attitudes. Um, so when people um, are in bypass, they're less likely to reach out for psychological or medical help uh, when they need. I've showed um, a few examples earlier about um, how dangerous that might be. Um, it, it's also positively related to things like religious coping, whether or not people use prayer uh, to cope with uh, difficulties. Um, it's positively related to post-traumatic growth. Um, and post-traumatic growth um, is a metric of how much people respond in a positive way to a traumatic event um, in their life. And then lastly, it's negatively related to divine struggles. So when you experience a tension in your relationship to God, but it's positively related to demonic struggle. So seeing uh, yourself as under um, kind of the focus or the attack of a demonic uh, presence. All of this um, we gathered from uh, the scale that we developed in 2017, which you see in front of you, um, and uh, it's made up of two factors of psychological avoidance and spiritualizing. I won't go into a lot of detail uh, today about that, but um, we've been able to gather quite a bit of good information out of this, which we're um, integrating into um, the chapters of our book, which is where I'll stop, um, is just where we go next. Um, we have a 15 chapter book that we're working on. And really the next part of the book is really uh, delving into how does bypass relate to things like trauma and coping? Um, how does bypass relate to shame? How does it relate to addiction? How does it relate to forgiveness? Um, so on and on. And then um, lastly, we talk about um, different ways of approaching it um, in the context of counseling and psychotherapy. And with that, I will go ahead and stop sharing my screen. And I will take um, any questions that are out there. At least I think that's what I'm supposed to do, Harry. Yeah. Um, Jesse, thank you. Oh, my gosh. Um, that was really informative. Uh, I'm a lay person, obviously, and I see your, you know, you, the colleagues that are, have joined you. And uh, mm -hmm. Dean Scomp is with us today. Um, that was really impactful for me on a number of levels and if i can just can i just take two minutes maybe go for it mm -hmm. so you, you when you um presented the slide uh of the of, of the of the wisconsin case yes uh newman i believe that was the name yeah i i, I remember there were uh, multiple instances in the period of, I think, the mid 80s, early 90s, and maybe even before uh, that I had encountered by way of the news, um, et cetera, and where individuals of uh, very strict religious um, beliefs were, you know, not seeking or preventing um, their loved ones from uh, obtaining what would be considered as, as necessary or medical treatments. And part of the argument was that's a freedom, and I'm, I'm not expecting you to go into the legal aspects of it, but part of the argument, if I remember, was, you know, that's freedom of religion, right? And that was a really, really prickly uh, situation. Um, and then what it made me think about when you, as you developed it further, um, <clears throat> was how, in terms of your eight dimensions of wellness, that a person's going to make a choice, right, as to um, potentially what dimension or what which dimensions they might rely on more or less. Yes. And. If I understood as a layperson what you were developing, what you what you you're, you what people like you do, you specialists like you, in the psychotherapy sessions, I'm guessing, is help an individual better understand 
why they feel the way they feel or how their interpretations of different aspects of these dimensions right. are um, affecting them. That's right. Okay. Um, so I'm on this. I'm, I'm, I'm doing okay then. And then, and I'll be done, but this is how impactful this was. Um, there was a period of time in my early life when uh, I went through, I experienced um, a series of deaths of individuals in my family that were very close to, to me, like my mother, my grandparents, et cetera, in the span of three or four years. And I remember saying to myself as a kid, there couldn't be a God because a God, as I understood God at that time in my life, et cetera, going to church, would never, you know, put somebody through this. Yes. And um, so that was my spiritual bypass. That would be like an, a, a type of spiritual bypass, right, to get me through that aspect or help me cope with that? Am I thinking about that? Well, um, it's, it's complicated. Um, so, so there's – I get this question quite frequently when it comes to how does this relate to, um, you know, kind of various religious teachings, theological perspectives. And um, – the thing that I like to differentiate between kind of the teaching and spiritual bypass is how the teaching is appropriated. Appropriate. So, so there are teachings about how death works, how suffering works, how guilt works, all of those kind of negative, affective, evoking um, experiences uh, that are part of life, right? Spiritual bypass isn't so much about the teaching as it is about how it's appropriated. So when um, an individual appropriates that um, teaching, whatever the content of that teaching might be, as a way of avoiding the difficulty that the teaching evokes, that's closer to what I'm talking about. Mm, that's a, okay. Thank yeah. You. Thank yeah. So, so one thing I like to talk a lot about is how religious language functions for people. And there's really kind of three basic levels uh, that religious language functions at the most basic level um, is first order religious language. And it's focused on primarily uh, the content of the, the teaching second order religious language um, is a step in terms of complexity. Um, and it, looks back at the teaching and it critically analyzes it and it says okay where did that teaching come from within my tradition how is it applied for me so a lot of counseling i think is helping people move from a level one of just what does the teaching say to level two of how is that affecting me who taught my teacher that um, does that come from a sacred uh, scripture how is that sacred scripture interpreted for me? Does that make sense? So then the third order would be people who pursue like theological training. They look at this long term um, and they're going to be looking at it from the perspective of, OK, what are the strengths, the weaknesses of how this is taught within our tradition, but maybe also in other people's traditions? Okay. Does that yeah, yeah, that's a lot to unwrap, but I appreciate it. And yes. I, I really do appreciate it and get, allowing me the time to um, bring this up. So I think um, their page uh, had a Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. but, um, and then Judy Burnett has uh, left you a message that she had to leave. But she okay. was, uh, this was very informative and incredibly relevant. Would love to hear more and am particularly interested in spiritual bypass and sexuality. Unfortunately, I must go, but we'll follow up with you, Jesse, exclamation point. Great job. Great. And then uh, Paige, are you are you still are you still with us? Yes, I am. All right. Yeah, I just mainly wanted to say, similar to Judy, this was this was excellent. And I really I know that we're colleagues and 
you know, that I'm certainly indirectly exposed to spiritual bypass, you know, through <laughs> working with you, Jesse. But I, I learned a tremendous amount about more the, the crux of what it is. And I really appreciated getting that opportunity. So I was just going to cool. say thank you. I very much enjoyed cool. it. Yeah, glad, glad you all could make it. Uh, Leela, did you have your hand up? Oh, it looks like you're still muted. I need to talk to you more as I embark on my sabbatical research um, this semester because, of course, you know, my work is around my work in Bhutan. And, you know, when I'm there, we, we as, um, as, as counselors, psychiatrists, you know, both Bhutanese and from other countries, are there, in their view, really to treat symptoms. And it's the monks who are treating the um, presence of evil spirits that are the primary treatment to actually um, um, heal whatever distress is going on. And um, so I'd really like to, to understand that a little bit better and maybe figure out how some of these um, measures and things, how I might conceptualize some of this a little bit differently because oh, yeah. um, it's positive and related to these demonic struggles. And so yes. that really, when, when you showed that, I went, holy cow. You know, because I've kind of always known this, but it just came into a whole new perspective for me listening to you talk. Yeah, yeah, that that's a really kind of newer thing uh, that we notice is um, there is this, well, at least in um, you know theistic terms, uh, you know, your relationship with God is great, right? And so you can kind of avoid sidestep some of the issues and go kind of directly to God um, and not have to worry about what what your role is. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, um, things aren't so good with the devil. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. So, you know, God might be for you, but the devil's definitely after you is kind of how that, that finding came out. So in, in a, um, <laughs> in a uh, non-Western context though, uh, you know, that it would be interesting to see how that language gets adapted. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so um, the the home base, the the um, uh, within uh, which which tradition of Buddhism are they from? Are they looking at things from? They're they're um, Tibetan, aren't they? Yes, it's Tibetan Buddhism. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so they may even have some kind of language for deity and, and everything. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. But on the other hand, um, you know, those negative demonic presences are going to create primarily the disruption um, yeah. in their life. Yeah, um, absolutely. You know, to be so, yeah. that things are not handicapped accessible because you have to maintain the um, barrier in your doorway so that the evil spirits can't come into different places. Yes. Yeah. And so um, the psychiatrists that you're working with, um, I, I would be interested to know if they make draw any distinction between um, uh, religious delusions, hallucinations versus religious experience. Yeah. Because, yeah, what I, I tend to find when people hear about this topic is that they'll kind of put together spiritual bypass with psychiatric delusions or psychiatric hallucinations, mm -hmm. um, which is which is slightly different. Right. Now, the, the demonic struggles and everything make all of those things even more pronounced right. when people are going through psychosis. Yeah. Uh, but you, it's not necessarily that they stop believing demons when they come out of psychosis or stop experiencing demons when they come out of psychosis. Right. That's where it gets complicated. So we definitely need a Zoom call with Dr. Sencho and Dr. Norola. We actually yeah. have to set that up if you'd like to talk to, with them. Absolutely, yeah. I, I'd be interested to learn from them how they, how they deal with that. Yeah, well, I don't know if I've ever told you the story of Dr. Sencho and kind of how mental health got started in Bhutan.
Uh -uh. His brother was a monk who was schizophrenic. And so um, sometime, not now, but we can sit down and talk about that. And I'll tell you that story because it's pretty fascinating. Interesting. Yeah. Well, cool. Yeah, I, I look forward to, to talking more about it. Yeah. Uh, it looks like some folks had to sign off. Um, yeah. So, but yeah, it's good to see everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's good to see you too. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jesse. Uh, yeah. Really, really. Um, pretty. This was this was um, pretty deep on a lot, a lot of layers. Boy, let me tell you. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, you. Thank you very much.